Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up. The women of Iran are named Time magazine's Heroes of the Year for leading the mass protests over the death of Masa Amini while being held in custody by the country's infamous morality police. Also, I'll be talking to Dr Jessica White, a counter-terrorism specialist, on the need for a gender lens when it comes to fighting extremism. And what happens when a group of schools in India implement a unisex uniform for all students and how its impact is felt way beyond the classroom? But first, and Time magazine has named the women of Iran who've been fighting for their rights through protests across the nation as its heroes of the year. Iran has been gripped by demonstrations for nearly three months, with human rights groups saying more than 400 people have died in the unrest. It's the first ever women-led counter-revolution. <laughs> They are just some of the women behind the most sustained uprising in the Islamic Republic of Iran's 43-year history. It's a movement that Time magazine says makes the women in the country Heroes of the Year, an award that in 2021 went to the scientists who developed the COVID-19 vaccine. The nationwide protest for women's rights was first sparked by the death of Masa Amini, who was allegedly killed in custody after being arrested by Iran's morality police in September. Now nearly three months on, the government claims the unit has been disbanded, a move that hasn't appeased critics in Iran or abroad. So when I heard that the news, which I believe was a little bit of misinformation, that the morality police was scrapped, I thought, wow, this is going to be a big distraction for the international solidarity because anyone who knows Iran knows that the morality police is not the problem. For many, the morality police is just the tip of the iceberg. Protesters are also calling for an end to compulsory veil wearing. I don't have a problem with wearing a hijab, but I don't agree that everyone must wear it. Everyone should be able to do as they like when it comes to the veil. With the regime determined to avoid this scenario, a bloody crackdown on protesters continues. Rights groups say over 400 people have died during the demonstrations. Now, in the post-9-11 world, counter-terrorism is a phrase we hear a lot about. But one counter-terrorism specialist is calling for a rethink of the sector, especially given increasing political polarisation, which is encouraging the spread of conspiracy and far-right extremism in Western countries. She also argues the need for the inclusion of women or a gender lens when dealing with security issues and has written a book about it. Joining me now from Washington, D.C., is Dr Jessica White, a counter-terrorism specialist from the Royal United Services Institute. Jessica, thank you so much for your time. How does the lack of a gender lens impact the way security organisations implement counter-terrorism policies? When you think about hard counterterrorism measures, such as military interventions, it's really essential to think about the way that the institution is structured, the military institution and security institutions, and to think about the patriarchy that exists within those structures. So to really consider the roles that women have been given and why they've been given those roles. Also to consider how masculinities and expectations of gender roles are in impacting men's actions in these spaces. And even when you're thinking about soft counterterrorism measures, such as programming that might be implemented to prevent or counter violent extremism either in a domestic or in a foreign space, that when you really, you need to consider how the local context would be impacted by gender norm expectations and the roles that women and men might be taking up in those violent extremist organizations, as well as in the roles they might be taking up as part of the peace and security programming. Jessica, can you give me some specific examples of where there's been a failure by security organisations in carrying out counter-terrorism operations because they just do not see it from a female perspective. 
Yeah, if, especially if you look back, there's been there's been a learning curve over the last you know 10, 20 years of counterterrorism in this in this modern counterterrorism context that we have focused on Islamist extremism. Uh, if you look back at some of the military operations, it was very clear in the beginning that they hadn't considered the gender lens. They hadn't thought about the impacts of their military operations in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and they they started to consider they what you know as they the challenges they met of could men could male soldiers search females in these local contexts? Well, no, they couldn't. It, it contravenes local gender expectations. So they started thinking about female engagement teams. And then there was a challenge even around that, about the expectations of women and just pulling them from their roles into these female engagement teams because they were women. And the challenges that presented to the women who perhaps you know did or didn't want to be a part of those teams. So it really, it opened the door to thinking about how these military operations really needed to consider that are using a wider gender lens and understanding both the local context and their own expectations of soldiers. And there's been examples of women joining terrorist groups, such as the Islamic State group, and it does seem security agencies tend to forget that. Yeah, there's definitely been a forgetting and a sort of a reconsidering, I think, of the agency that we think of women having in these spaces, because certainly there are cases of women being trafficked into these organizations. There are cases of women you know, being victims of these organizations, but there are also cases of women via their own agency choosing to join these organizations. And they... There has to be a reconsidering, I think, among security agencies and among even law enforcement agencies and judicial systems as we consider, you know, how to prosecute women that have chosen to join these organizations and how to really um, account for their participation equally with, with male participation. Yet, uh, Jessica, on the other hand, research by Swinburne University in Australia has found that anti-women attitudes are the biggest predictors of attitudes of violent extremism. In other words, if you were to sit a white supremacist down in the same room with a radical Islamist, the immediate thing that the two would have in common would be their hatred of women. Yeah, this is it's it's an interesting space and it's it's a relatively new space that we've uh, sort of been looking at more so in the field of misogyny and how misogyny plays a, a linking element uh, between many of these uh, extremist organizations between many extremist narratives even into conspiracy theories and disinformation but it certainly it does provide a similarity between many of these organizations, the roles that they expect women to take as part of these organizations, the roles that they you know, preach that women should play, uh, often very misogynist views. It also allows uh, different extremists in different contexts to really have a, a connecting factor across transnational context. They may have very different you know, nationalist, very different sort of local context to their extremist stance, whether that be far right or Islamist, but they're often connected to a trans national community via these misogynist elements of their narratives. But the reality is that most security agencies are still led by men and military leadership is still predominantly male. So how can you successfully change attitudes and approaches when this is the case? So we really do need to encourage the diversity of voices from the top down, because until you change the diversity of perspective within the institutions themselves, it is very difficult to ensure that it filters out into the policies that are being prepared by these institutions and then into the programming that they might be implementing on the ground. And we see that there is a lot of agreement at the high level, you know, international space that, yes, we do need to include women. Yes, this is an important element to consider gender. But it often doesn't filter down into on-the-ground programming. Jessica White, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Now to India, where an important step towards gender equality has been taken by school children. In some dozen schools in the state of Kerala, boys and girls have begun sporting a unisex uniform in the last three years. And teachers are already noticing a difference, both in the playground and in the classroom, as Catherine Keller Clifford reports. In India, where there's still a long path ahead towards gender equality, a small revolution is underway within a dozen schools in the south of the country. Boys and girls have abandoned their gendered uniforms, opting for a trousers for all policy. Anne is getting ready to go to school. 
there's no longer anything to distinguish her uniform from her brother John's. I used to have a skirt and blouse. Now I have these crop trousers. With these new clothes, I'm able to run and play. I love dressing like the boys. Anne's school was the very first in India to make the change, almost three years ago, following a request from parents. Our main goal was to bring a sense of equality to our children. Growing up, they should have the same self-esteem, share the same dreams, and know that they're equal. Since the pupils began wearing the same uniform, staff noticed the girls were occupying more space in the playground during break time. They can now climb, jump and play more freely than before. Before, with a skirt, I found it much harder to climb here. Now I can do it, and I love it. We can play exactly the same games as the boys. We even play football together now. And the changes aren't just being seen outside of the classroom. This high school brought in non-gendered uniforms last year. The maths teacher has since noticed that the girls have gained confidence in their work. Though this pupil agrees there's still much to be done for gender equality here. Uh, I don't think uh, merely a change in dress can only make them empowered. I mean, they must feel like boys. They must be able to uh, walk in the road at nights without any fear. The dozen schools which have brought in unisex uniforms are all in Kerala, seen as the most progressive of Indian states. And that's all for now. You can keep up with the 51% on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Plus, you can catch our previous programmes on the France 24 website. So until our next show, bye for now.